We welcome each of you that are here with us this morning and those that may be joining us online. It was a warm summer day. Just a number of years ago, I was, it was after the freshman year in college, which was just a few years ago, <laughs> or so it seems. The temperature was about 96 degrees in one of the most delightful places in the nation, Minneapolis, Minnesota, <laughs> the land of 10,000 lakes. Now, I doubt that many of you have had cause to travel to the far east of California, but if you've had occasion to do that several years ago, you would have found that it was a very pleasant place to live and a very welcoming place at the same time. I had worked in the store for about five years. It was, a, it was a large store and a small store at the same time, a corner store, just a couple of gondolas, and occasionally the boss would give me the key and say, lock up, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning. So that evening, he happened to be working. He was moving to the adjacent building next to ours, and he was working next door. As shoppers came in and placed their items um, on the counter, I would ring them out and they would exit the door. Everything was going fine, and it was just a little after dark, about 8 o'clock in the evening. I looked out the glass windows, and there was about a half a dozen shoppers in the store. When one shopper came up and asked for a bunch of things that were behind me. So I dutifully got him his favorite candy bar, turned around, got him uh, some smoking things, turned around and got him something else, turned around a fourth time, and the fourth time I turned around, he pulled out something from underneath his belt, and it was a revolver, and he said, give me the money, to which I duly finished ringing him up. Pulled the 20s out, the 10s out, the 5s out, the 1s out, put them in my hand, handed them to him. He took them and he left. The lady standing immediately adjacent to him placed her things on the counter. And just to make sure that nobody did anything foolish, I proceeded to ring them up. And I said, that will be $17.23, ma'am. And she gave me a $20 bill. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't have change. We've just been robbed. And she looked at me with a certain surprise in her eyes. How could that be? And I didn't say too much else. Somebody went next door and got the boss and he came in. The police were called and all kinds of things happened that night. The suspect eventually was erupted, erupted, arrested. <laughs> he had interrupted us that evening. There are words that we speak during the day, and there are words that stay with us for a long, long time that get our attention. Now, what were the key words that I heard that evening? Give me the money. I had heard on the average, uh, it's been said that women speak 7,000 words a day in five different tones, and men speak 5,000 words in three different tones. So I had heard a lot of words that day, but to this day I can remember those words. It's interesting how sometimes words stay with us, isn't it? Now, by way of comparison and contrast, I remember sitting in Minneapolis and hearing an evangelist. He had traveled all the way from Texas. His name was Richard Barron and Ray Turner. Some of you may recognize the names. Both, um, both have been laid to rest. And as I listened to the words coming from Scripture, my heart was open. And I heard those words of life. And as he explained the scriptures and Christ's death on the cross, my heart was touched. 
And those words took hold of my life. And the Spirit impressed upon me that I must give my life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And those words have stayed with me through to this day. How is it in your life? Do you remember words? Now, using just the average, if 7,000 times 30 is 210,000 words, indeed, you ladies have done a few words in the last month. Now, gentlemen, you've spoken 150,000 words. But we use so many words so frequently that oftentimes those words become so common that we miss some of the critical ones. So I'd invite you this morning to reflect with me a little bit on the way that words shape our lives. Words shape our ideas and our actions, and words shape our character. Scripture speaks that words determine your destiny. The words we speak is a matter of life and death. We can experience blessings in our lives by the words we speak, but we can also experience destruction in our lives if we speak words that cause destruction. We can control our whole life if we can control one part of ourselves, the scripture says. That small little part that so often gets us in trouble called the tongue. Like a rudder on a, that steers a big ship, our words can determine the direction of our lives. We have to give an account before God in the day of judgment for every, every careless word we speak. Therefore, we must be careful over every word that we speak. We must have a good heart and speak good words out of a heart of overflowing goodness and graciousness to others. So consider with me for just a few moments today. A few scriptures that speak about words and an anchor passage found in Acts chapter 5 that you will find interesting, I think, by way of comparison and contrast when we get there. Because the, first, uh, the two sections in that passage don't seem to at first relate in a very harmonious way. Just a few references, though. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 speaking about words that we may use and words that we may hear. The tongue has the power of life in death, and those who love it will eat of its fruit. The tongue has the power over what? What does the scripture say? Life and death. Matthew says, you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart speaks the mouth. What? How in the world can one writer so succinctly nail it? How is it that inside of us, in all of our humanness, and all that flows forth, how can we speak good? The good man brings good things out of the good that's stored up in him, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give account in the day of judgment for every careless word that they've spoken. For by your deeds you will be acquitted, and by your deeds you may be condemned. Proverbs says, you're snared about by the words of your mouth. You are taken back by the words of your mouth. With that... I am really ready to sit down and just be silent, lest I get myself in trouble. I've been known to do that, occasionally in the pulpit and more occasionally at home and outside the pulpit. But it's an interesting thing. As easy as it is to go down that slippery slope of not paying, it, paying attention to how our words affect not only ourselves, but those we're speaking to. Our words have also tremendous power to do good, to build other, others up, to make things right between us and the Lord. James 3, 
One more passage that speaks of the importance. Not many of you should, be, should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If, if anyone is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses, we make them obey us. We can turn the whole animal or take ships, for example, although they are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by only a spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body it corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire occasionally by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are tamed and have been tamed by man. But no man can tame his tongue. It is restless evil, full of deadly poison. With the tongue we praise the Lord God our Father, and with the tongue we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. So the question is, would you agree? The problem is, upon reflection in the quietness of our own lives, we probably have occasion to realize at times we slip into the carelessness in our word selection and how we talk to one another. Maybe you don't, but you know somebody who does. Because it's easier to spot when somebody else is doing it than to catch it ourselves before it's a moment on the lips and forever out of our mouths. Not to be ever taken back. Not to be retracted in the harm that sometimes comes forth. Words of life that build up or words of hurt and damage that tear down. The same tongue speaks both. And the use of that tongue is guided by the Spirit or guided by ourselves. I'd invite you to go or come with me to Acts chapter 5. Because in Acts chapter 5, we find there two stories that have the overlay and are interrelated in somewhat of a unique way. In the first half, of Acts chapter 5, we find there a story of a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, as they had, they had sold a possession. At first, this doesn't seem to have anything to do with a topic of words. And the second half of the story really does have to do with the use of words. So I'm going to reflect for just a moment and share with you the essence of the first several uh, verses in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, you may recall the story of Ananias and Sapphira by memory. And we go back to look at this story because the patterns and trends of the early church, my friends, I believe are patterns and trends that we can learn from. In two aspects, we can learn the lessons of others that we might not uh, we might not repeat their mistakes. If I have a choice, life has shown me it's er, it's easier to learn from others' mistakes than to bear the consequences of learning from my own. How is it in your life? You like that idea, learning from others rather than experiencing the causes and effects of having to learn it firsthand. Well, Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, opens 
uh, with this story that Peter uh, came to Ananias. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira had sold a possession, a property that they had, and they had pledged to the Lord that they were going to return the proceeds of that which they possessed to the Lord. Now that was a pledge between them and the Lord. And Peter, the follower of Christ, said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not yours? And after it was sold, was it not in your power? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied unto men, but you have lied unto whom? Unto God. I can understand potentially lying to one another. It's really hard when you start lying to God, isn't it? You see, our words sometimes are spoken to others. And there are words that we speak by thoughts and pledges to God. Words nonetheless. So these are words that emanated from the heart at one time a pledge to God. And at for some reason that's unnoted here, those words and that pledge was quickly retracted. There's a word called integrity. It's a small word. Do you like the word? I like it. I like it because I like people who have integrity. I believe God is a person of integrity. There's another word called hypocrisy. Have you ever experienced hypocrisy? Have you ever seen it in another person's life? Have you ever experienced it in the edges of your own life? Wait a minute, I promised to do that quite some time ago and I haven't gotten to it. Unintentional hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, hypocrisy is defined as claiming the virtues of doing something and not doing it. Hmm. It might describe the pathway of most Christians. Wanting to do things, but not quite doing them and carrying out what we tell God we will do. The good news is, the good news is, the words of life are, there's hope for you today if you find yourself in that group, because Christ is forgiving. And the words of life today are that He wants each one of us to have a deepening and deeper relationship with Him. Does that make sense? So you know the story very well. Peter says, Ananias, why did you do this? And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on them that heard these things. And the young man rose wound him up and carried him off and buried him. There's not much more that the preacher should say. He should just sit down and let you all think about that and let the preacher himself think about that. It is bad enough to hear that story once, but you know what's coming next, don't you? So Sapphira shows up, his wife. Peter says pretty much the same thing. She didn't know what had happened to her husband. He was gone. He said, you made a promise to God, you and your husband, to return that possession which you dedicated to him. 
And what has happened that you've kept back part of that? Peter said unto her, How is it that you've agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have carried out your husband are at the door, and they shall carry you out. Those are not words that you want to hear from somebody at church. It's not a good day to hear those words. Then she fell down straightway at his feet, yielded up the ghost, and the young men came in and found her dead, carried her forth, buried her husband. And great fear came on all the church upon as many as heard these things. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders among the people, and they were all in one accord in Solomon's porch. And I scratched my head as I read this for three or four dozen times this week. And I said, Lord, every time I read this, I get more depressed. Where is the hope and what is the message? I don't want to be in this group, Lord. Keep me out of this group. I don't want to go to one church one day, have somebody come up and tell me, guess what? They're going to carry you out. You've got a few more steps left in your path. I don't want to be, to be today, and I don't want to be that way when the Lord comes. I want things to be right in my life with the Lord Jesus Christ today. How about you, friends? I want my steps to follow where He leads. I want my hands to be used by Him. I want my words to be His words. But my tongue is unruly at times. And I've chewed so much of it. So we have to find, we have to read the second half of Acts chapter 5. Because as bad as the first half is, the second half, by way of antithesis, is filled with so much splendor. And it doesn't look that way at first. So follow with me. Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. As the disciples were ministering, their miracles, uh, they were bringing people to Peter because they knew that through the power of God, people on their beds in sickness were being healed, and just bringing them to him, hundreds were healed. Unclean spirits were cast out. In verse 17, the high priest rose up. And all that they were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, were filled with indignation. They were mad, and they laid hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. And by the angel of the Lord by night came and opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Now, did you catch this? <laughs> now, now, realize we have freedom of speech, don't we, in this country? Have you ever been jailed? for giving your testimony? Has a sheriff ever said, wait a minute, I'm going to arrest you? Have the leaders of the church said, uh, by the way, it won't be the sheriff, we've talked to him, so don't be coming back to church, because he's picking you up tonight, and you're going to jail, because you've testified of what God is doing in your life. It's never happened, has it? We think... We think at times, if we somehow share our faith, we won't get it right. And we stop short, lest we say or do or are embarrassed of proclaiming what God is doing in our life. Have you ever been there? I've been there. At times listening, watching for that open door, but hesitating to go through it. Friends, time is short. The only thing worse than muffing it by using incorrect words or wrong phrases is saying nothing at all. Because silence 
doesn't move the mission of Christ ahead. You see, go and stand. The angel of the Lord opened the doors of the prison that night. Go and stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Do you catch the context? Do you get the symbolism? Here they're to preach all of the words of life. But where are they? They're in prison. They're in a hostile environment. The religious leaders of the day have come and locked them up. And the angel appears and says, here is your mission. The same ones who crucified Christ have now imprisoned you, regardless of how tough it is. You take and go by the Spirit of God, and you go into the temple, and you proclaim the goodness of God. Hallelujah! Christ's voice is not to be silenced, but Christ's voice is to be uttered by your tongue, friends. Christ's voice is to go places where the preacher can't go this week. Christ is calling you to take the words of life into your homes, onto your jobs, to your neighbors, to your friends, to those who don't know you. Are you ready? Are you anxious? Are you willing to be used in that capacity? Words of life or words of indifference, words of hope or words of discouragement. How's it going to be when he's looking and calling you today, friends? It's a tall order. When they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. And the high priest came, the scripture says, and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. And as you know, they found that they were not in prison anymore. An amazing story. We've read it scores of time. It's an amazing story in the first half of judgment and hypocrisy. It's an amazing story of deliverance and grace because God is calling His people to mission today. And He's not calling just the clergy. He's not just calling the learned. He's not just calling the educated. He's calling every single one of us who have yielded our hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ to take the words of life into the junior high, into the elementary school, on the job, to those who are indifferent, to those who love the Lord with their heart, to share with them, to share with them the, whole, the words of hope and life that Jesus has given to us. Verse 28 says, Did we not stand, uh, straightly command you that you should not teach, uh, teach in his name? And behold, 28 says, Behold, you have filled all of Jerusalem and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Then Peter said the words that ring down through the ages. We ought to obey God rather than man. And the chapter closes. It says, And daily in the temple, in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So we've looked at the importance of words. And if there ever was a time that the phrase words are important and words matter, there is ever a time in earth's history that phrase is a buzz in our culture today. Words do matter. The story of Ananias and Sapphira, words are to be lived out, not just professed. The integrity of our words determine our character. And we're called to carry out the purpose and mission of Christ to bring words of life that are true, timely, tempered, tender, and transformational. I'd like to suggest to you that uh, just a bit of an acronym, if you write 200 words a minute, this will take you about 14 seconds. 
just building off the letters in word of life. Our words must be warm to the listener. They don't start with, you're going to hell if you don't believe this. They start with something like this, warm words. You know, Christ has such a great love for all of us that whatever issues you have today, He's concerned about. I'd like to pray for you. Is there something I can pray for you about? Warming and touching, reaching into another person's life. The Owen word is for its other person, other-centered conversation. It's not about me and my. It's not about, it's not about me and how things are in my life. It's how are things in your life. It's relational in nature. It's desirable. It's salting, placing salt in their life, giving them hope. The L in life would be for loving. The I is for inviting. The F is for friendly. And the E is for encouraging. We are called not only to enjoy a relationship with Jesus Christ, but if all we do is accept it, and all we do is enjoy it, and all we do is keep it, as good as that may be, we haven't carried out, nor are we, nor are we participating in the mission of sharing His words of life to each person that we come in contact with. I believe, friends, words matter. And the words that matter to Him is our sharing His words of life with each person that we come in contact with. May God bless you this week as you go through the days and the hours that you'll be able to reach in to others' lives to come alongside them and share the words of hope, forgiveness, and love that Christ has for you that others may be drawn to Jesus. Let us pray. Father, it is with hearts filled with gratitude that we have spent time with You today. And through the multitude of words, we hear ringing in our ears the words of Acts chapter 5 to share with other the words of life. The words that there is life and hope through having a relationship with Jesus Christ. Father, bless us as we depend on You by the power and presence of Your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our words, our thoughts, and our actions that our tongues may be used to glorify You. And Father, that those words might find lodging and create a desire in other people's lives to have a relationship with You as we have enjoyed, that You might be glorified. So, Father, we ask for forgiveness where we've fallen short in those areas. We ask for forgiveness and an infilling of Your Holy Spirit that we might glorify You by taking Your words of life on our tongues and in our lives through this week. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen.